I know you like it long, but all I can offer right now is a micro episode, hopefully not a psychotic one, though you never know with me, do you? <laughs> Okay, Shoshanim, Shvanpanim, Shovavim, everything, Madmadim. Today we are going to discuss, however briefly, a few unresolved issues, questions you keep sending me, and it's clear that I haven't been clear enough. And I owe you, at the very least, clarity. Okay, introjects and hoovering. When the narcissist comes across someone who he deems a potential source of narcissistic supply, a possible intimate partner, the narcissist takes a snapshot of that person. He introjects, he internalizes and introjects this person. He creates an internal object that represents that external object, that person. And then he idealizes the snapshot, he photoshops the snapshot, he idealizes the snapshot, and then he proceeds with the relationship. This phase is known as love bombing. Okay, throughout the relationship, the narcissist coerces you, forces you, blackmails you to conform to the idealized introject, to the idealized internal object. And if you don't, he penalizes you, he punishes you. And so, at some point, the narcissist has to separate from you and individuate. I'm not going to it. There's like 20 videos here which deal with this. At some point, he has to devalue you. And it's identical to the process of idealization. It's like rewinding a movie. It's going backwards. So, when the narcissist idealizes you, he coerces you to conform to the idealized image. And when the narcissist devalues you, he's doing exactly the same. He coerces you to conform to the devalued image. And that is known as projective identification. He alters, he modifies your behavior in ways which adhere to the devalued object or persecutory object, paranoid object, enemy object, he forces you to behave in ways which confirm and affirm and buttress and support and uphold his negative view of you, the same way he did when he thought that you were the world, that you were the center of the world, that you were the most, most beautiful, most intelligent, most everything, perfect, a perfect being. So when you're idealized, he pushes you to be perfect, and when you're devalued, when he devalues you, he pushes you to act malevolently. He pushes you to uh, undermine him, to betray him. And this is the narcissist's betrayal fantasy. So on both ends of the relationship, the love bombing idealization phase, where the snapshot or the interject or the internal object is idealized, photoshopped, and the end the end game of the relationship, where the narcissist devalues and discards you, on both ends of the relationship, the narcissist uses coercion, uh, molding you, sculpting you, changing you, brainwashing you, and training you, taking over your mind, um, so as to tame you, domesticate you, housebreak you, make you conform to the internal object, whether this internal object is idealized or devalued. Okay, until now, right. Then the narcissist discards you, and for reasons that I describe in other videos about hoovering, I recommend that you watch them, he hoovers you, he re-idealizes you. He, he dusts off the old snapshot, he takes the snapshot out of the library, because he has a library of snapshots of significant others. So he takes your snapshot out of the library, he poofs, poofs off the dust, and now he has a snapshot. And now he photoshops the snapshot yet again. He re-idealizes the snapshot. 
And then he approaches you in an attempt to coerce you to conform to the re-idealized snapshot. The snapshot that used to be devalued is now re-idealized. It's again perfect and ideal and drop-dead gorgeous and super intelligent and amazing and unprecedented. And you need to conform to all these expectations. And so the narcissist again coerces you, uses again love bombing techniques, brainwashing, and training, and other forms of coercion to make you conform to the re-idealized snapshot. Okay, until now, what happens when you resist? What happens when you refused, refuse to be hovered? When you declined the offer to be re-idealized? When you tell the narcissist to F off, when you go no contact, really no contact, effectively no contact. Like you don't stalk him on social media, for example, and you don't send him messages via third parties, because that is not no contact. That is being weak. That is being addicted. That is being unbounded. To stalk your ex, to send him messages through third parties from anonymous accounts, that is laughable. That is laughable and that is contemptible. And you should not do this because you should go no contact. Now imagine that you're a strong person and you persist and you insist and you wouldn't, you, you refuse to be in any sort of touch with the narcissist. You don't let, you don't give him the opportunity to coerce you into being re-idealized. You refuse to play his game by his rules. You walk away. You cut him off. What then? The narcissist is faced with a dilemma. He has inside his mind a re-idealized internal object. And there is an external object, you, who refuses to conform, refuses to collaborate and collude in the re-idealization process of the internal object. The internal object is now perfect. The external object is rejecting, frustrating, and that external object is you. You're telling the narcissist, never again, no more, go away, I don't want to see you. <laughs> There's a restraining order, you will end up in prison, and so on and so forth. So, what does the narcissist do then? As you see, when there is a discrepancy between the internal object and the external object, the narcissist experiences dissonance. It's known as cognitive dissonance. He experiences cognitive dissonance. Dissonance is a strong sense of inner conflict and discomfort when there are two things that are incompatible, mutually exclusive and contradictory. Two beliefs, two expectations, two hopes, two values, two thoughts, two anything. When they conflict, they create dissonance and dissonance generates anxiety and anxiety is intolerable what how does the narcissist resolve the cognitive dissonance when you refuse to play along and to go along with the hoovering attempt when you reject him outright unequivocally fully unambiguously for good what does the narcissist do then of course <laughs> he rewrites history and reality that's his major defense in, in all cases. He convinces himself that he never wanted you really in the first place. Like it, he never did really want you. He was doing you a favor by hoovering you. He was giving you a second chance and you flunked it as he had expected you to do. And he is the one who discarded you this time. This second time, having tried to hoover you, you were not the one who turned him down. He was the one who decided that after all, you're not compatible, you're not up to the job, you're not qualified. So he rewrites, he reframes reality and history delusionally to convince himself that he was magnanimous in his effort to hoover you. He was providing you with a chance to fix yourself, to heal yourself, to... Um, 
uh, kind of re make reparations on your mistakes. And you, stupidly, because you are stupid, <laughs> stupidly, you rejected his offer. A once in a lifetime offer, never recurring. And so, and having proven your inanity and stupidity, he doesn't want you now. He's the one who discarded you. The hoovering petered off, not because he wouldn't collaborate, but, but because he wouldn't persist. That's the way, that's the story the narcissist tells himself when he's turned down in a hoovering attempt. And the aim is to preserve the integrity of the internal space of the narcissist, the space which hosts all the internal objects. What the narcissist does, he re-idealizes, he retouches, he, he photoshops your snapshot in his mind, your mental representation in his mind, the internal objects, the object that stands in for you in his mind, he, he re-idealizes it, he photoshops it, renders it perfect, he then approaches you and tries to coerce you into conforming to with this conforming to this re-idealized object. If you turn him down, he's gonna instantly redevalue the object, redevalue the internal object, and render it a persecutory object, an enemy, in short. And this is exactly what the narcissist does in whenever he comes across any form of narcissistic injury or mortification. I recommend that you watch my interview with Dalia Zhukovska, the Polish clinical psychologist, uh, my interview about mortification. I explain these mechanisms in uh, detail there. Okay, I hope I've answered your questions. When you go away, when you're discarded or when you break up with the narcissist, when you walk away, when you walk off, you are still there. Your representation in the narcissist's mind survives. It is imbued with emotions. It is cathected. Negative emotions. You're devalued in his mind. Or fantastic emotions. Fantasy. Fantasy defense. You're idealized. One way or the other. The narcissist never lets go of you as far as the internal object. When the narcissist, when the narcissist time on earth comes, when he passes away, <laughs> There are thousands of introjects in his mind, in various stages of undress. Some of them are idealized, some of them are devalued, some of them are being re-idealized. There's a library, giant library, which he constantly plays with, constantly cathects and decathects, emotionally invests in and disinvests in, commits himself to and runs away, etc., etc. So there's this management software that runs this introject library in his mind. And the critical thing is for the external object to match 100% the internal object that represents it in the narcissist's mind. No daylight. The narcissist dedicates his entire life to forcing people, extorting people, coercing people into becoming inert internal objects, extensions of himself in the fullest sense, figments of his fantasy, imagination, and utterly demented mind.